Hey, want to know a little bit more about me? Well, today I'm going to be doing a Q&A session, answering all of the questions that you've sent me, whether it's about gardening, whether it's about my garden here, or whether it's about me. So let's get started. Hey everyone, how's it going and welcome back. So a few weeks ago, I put a shout out on my YouTube community tab, my Facebook page and my Instagram, giving you guys the opportunity to ask me any questions that you might have. And I got a lot of questions. So today I'm gonna to do a full Q&A session, answering all of those, hopefully to your satisfaction. And we'll cover all sorts of things, some plant-based stuff, questions about the garden and questions about me. Now, this is not the first time that I've recorded this video, and that's because I tried to record it yesterday evening when the light was beautiful and the garden was supposed to be really quiet, but it didn't exactly go according to plan. I'm just gonna wait while another plane passes over. Back to all of this can just be done single-handedly. Nice, another plane. I will wait until the plane passes. Oh really nice, but you're shaping it not only aesthetically in the Netherlands, and it's the home of Piet Udolf. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? It really did not go according to plan. So this is attempt number two, and I'll try and answer all of your questions all over again. So the first question comes from Jeff and Deb Shipton, and they ask, can you give us a rough idea of where you live? Yep, yeah, certainly. So. I live in Ireland and most of you will know that if you've been watching my videos for a while or if you're a subscriber to the channel. But to be a little bit more specific, I live just north of Dublin. I live in a county called County Meath. Certainly in Ireland, it's actually quite a big county and it has a little bit of coastline, but most of it is inland. And it's also known as certainly part of Ireland's ancient east um, because there's a whole load of really old archaeology sites and things like that, old chambered cairns. It's a really historic area and it's absolutely lovely. So I'm about 15 miles from the coast, so I do get the kind of temperate nature of being near the coast, but I am also that little bit inland, so it does tend to get a little bit more cold in the winter. And then in terms of where I am from our capital, Dublin, I'm about 40 minutes drive. Okay, straight on to question number two. And this question is, what do you love most about your garden? Is it what made you live where you live? Well, that's fairly easy because what I love about the garden is how old and mature it feels. Do you know if you go and you see a garden and it does just have that really kind of elderly feeling, like the trees and the plants are really mature and the spaces are mature? That's what this garden has. All of the old gnarled apple trees, there's hedges everywhere, there's lovely little enclosed spaces and it all just feels really developed and mature. That's what I fell in love with, with this garden. And certainly, obviously, when we bought the house, we liked the house, but I really fell for the garden. And it was all of the things I've just described that made me fall for it instantly. So here comes a cracker of a question, and it comes from Erica. Now, Erica has her own gardening YouTube channel called Erica's Little Welsh Garden. I'll link it up here if you wanna go and check it out. I've been following her for a while now, and she's brilliant. And she asks a whopper of a question. So she asks, you may have answered this already in a video, but did you inherit the garden pretty much as it is when you purchased the house? And have you been able just to keep on top of it and maintain it? Or have you done a lot of the landscaping yourself? If you inherited it, do you know much about what the previous owners did over the years? Or did they get a landscaper to do it? How old is the house and the garden? Basically, I want to know the history. Okay, Erica, so here is the potted history of the house and the garden. So we moved in just over 18 months ago, back in the autumn of 2019. And when we bought the house, the house was about 40 years old. It was built in the late 70s and it was actually built by the owners that we bought it off. So they had the house built and they developed the whole garden. 
Believe it or not, the garden used to just be a barley field. So everything that you see here, other than the things that I've changed, obviously, were created by them. Now, as far as I'm aware, they didn't use a landscaper. It's just something that was built up over time. And really, I think they've done a lovely job. Now, in terms of me putting my stamp on the garden, I've really been taking the first year or so just to get an idea and get to grips with what actually needs done, how much work it is and how long it takes. Things like staying on top of the grass, staying, well, badly on top of the weeds, trimming the hedges and things like that. Uh, what I have been doing though is I have been starting to make my mark on the garden. I've taken down all the cypress hedges at the back to bring in a whole load more light. I've got no mow areas and I've made the veg garden and renovated the polytunnel and it's not going to stop there. I'm going to keep on going through this but really all of those changes so far that have been made I've done them myself. I haven't used a landscaper or anything like that but I have had a bit of help. It's not all done single-handedly. Okay, so Carol Chamberlain asks, how many acres do you live on? It might be enough land to get goats so that you don't need to mow the lawn. Okay, Carol, so goats do sound awesome. I really hope that my other half, my partner, doesn't watch this video because all you're gonna do is encourage him to get goats. And goats are great, but I don't really want goats in my garden, even if they do cut the grass. <laughs> In terms of how much land we have, so the garden is pretty large. It's an acre and it's a really kind of long, narrow acre. And in fact, behind me, the garden tapers off into a point down in the corner off over my shoulder, which makes it even longer. But certainly it is a big garden. It's an acre. So Lorraine G asks a question. Is this your first proper veg garden? Have you always had an interest and had veg gardens in your prior home? Well, Lorraine, Yes, this is my first proper veg garden. I've never made or had a veg garden on this scale ever before. So it's very, very new to me. And I gotta be honest, in the past, I'm not sure I would have been that into growing veg. I would have always been more into garden design and the ornamentals of gardens, but I have dabbled with veg growing before. And actually, just to tell you a funny story, we used to rent a house a few years ago and the people that owned the house left a whole load of scrap timber in their garage that was meant to be cut up and was meant to go into the stove to heat the house. And I pilfered a whole load of it, turned it into raised beds, put them in the garden and grew some veggies instead. I don't think they had a problem with it, but certainly that kind of got me hooked on trying to grow veg. So when we wanted to find a house to buy, really there had to be room to have a veg garden. And when we found here, it had the perfect spot for the veg garden. And in fact, we're gonna come back to the veg garden in a couple of weeks and I'll show you exactly what it's looking like now that I've got it planted up. Okay, so time for some plant-based questions. And the first one comes from my pug and I, and they ask, if you could only grow or sow one thing, what would it be? Okay, you know how to ask a really difficult question because I've been thinking about this for ages and I'm still stuck between two plants. So for me, it's either going to be Stipa gigantea or Verbena bonariensis. Stipa or Verbena. So what I love about both of them is that really quite large but very sort of translucent quality that they have. And when they're planted on mass, I just think they look incredible. I love the flowers that are on Verbena, those little purple flowers that are really high up. They're awesome, but at the same time, I love Stipa. Okay, I am gonna go with Stipa gigantea because I could totally imagine an entire garden planted with that and nothing else. It's on such a huge scale that it looks incredible. The flowers are lovely. Then when they turn to seed, that lovely golden color that they have just looks brilliant. And then they're gonna overwinter and get frost on them. Yeah, yeah, I'm decided. Stipa gigantea, that is what I would grow if I could only grow one thing. And a very similar question comes from my little UK garden and they ask, what is the one thing you always wish you'd grown more of? And do you ever have regrets for growing too much of anything? Okay, so the one thing that I wish I had grown more of is basically all kinds of edibles, not just one plant. And that's because I still haven't quite nailed what I think is an art, the art of successional sowing. Quite often I'll grow something edible that's really tasty and I'll only get one little harvest of it. That's something that I wish I could get better at. So it's not just one plant, it's a whole load of things. Do I regret ever having too much of anything? No, 
never. So for starters, this garden is more than big enough. I can always find somewhere to plant stuff. But then in terms of harvest, if I have too much or if I have too many plants, I give them away. I've always found somebody that's willing to take them. And in fact, even the apple trees, we have so many apples every autumn that uh, we have like a local residence WhatsApp group. And I last autumn donated a whole load of the apples to everybody else around here. I just put them in a crate, put them at the front gate and people drove past and took them, which I thought was kind of nice sharing the love. At least this morning is a lot quieter than yesterday evening. This is a lot better for doing this. So the next question that I've got comes from Woodward Watercolors and he asks me four different things. So he goes, what is your favorite indoor plant, shrub, tree, and finally annual? Okay, indoor plant has to be a ZZ plant. Needs so little light, totally bulletproof, but looks really architectural. I love it. The one that I have, I absolutely adore. Shrub. Is box a shrub? Could I get away with that? Okay, I'm gonna say box anyway, because it can be a bush. You can clip it down into spheres. You can have it as little square boxes. It can be hedging. You can topiarize it into shapes. You name it, you can do it with box. And what I love is particularly if you have a really naturalistic planting, but you put box spheres or box cubes into it, it just makes it look really designy and really curated. I love it for that. Tree. That's an easy one. Cornus controversa variegata. I have one in the front garden. I go on about it all the time because I love it so much. It's just the best thing ever. It's a wedding cake tree. If you don't have one, go and get yourself one. They don't grow too big and they just look really, really architectural and beautiful. Finally, annual calendula. I love that real hit of orange color. It's a hardy annual, so it's easy to grow, particularly in an Irish climate where the weather can be hit and miss even in the summer and also it works as a beautiful companion plant. Now I am just going to say one warning. I can bet that by next year I'll have probably changed my favourite plants but those are what my favourites are at the minute. So the next question comes from Garden in Tipperary and they ask favourite plants for wildlife. Okay so for me it has to be foxgloves. Uh, they're native to Ireland and I think there's always something nice about planting natives. They look beautiful, they're easy to grow, they're great for wildlife and pollinators, they'll self-seed really easily, they're so adaptable, so it has to be foxgloves. If you don't like foxgloves, then my other curveball choice would actually be Nomo. It's not a single plant, but it's really interesting to let a patch go and see what native plants you have that are gonna come up in your own grass. Next question comes from And Your Little Dog. And they ask, what is your holy grail plant that you've always wanted to grow? Okay, can I have two? I feel like I'm cheating in all of these questions. Okay, so my two uh, ornamental, it would have to be a multi-stemmed small amelanchier tree. And in fact, I'm definitely going to be getting one at some point because I want one in the garden. Those lovely fine woody stems. And then in the spring, they have lovely little white flowers that I actually think are more beautiful than cherry blossom. Then it's got nice green foliage and then really lovely autumn color in that foliage. It's fantastic. But then if it had to come to an edible, I would say an artichoke because it looks amazing. It's huge. It's like it's just on some other scale but I've never grown one and I've never eaten one. So I'm actually growing my holy grail plant this year. I'm gonna try it this year and see how it goes. But those would be my two picks. And the very final plant-based question comes from Malk1275 and they ask, have you got any blueberry plants? No, I don't have any blueberry plants yet. And that's because someone I know has a couple of mature blueberry plants that in fact are fruiting this year, but they're going to be moving house. And I believe I have a very kind offer to get them. So I'm looking forward to that and I'm keeping my fingers crossed that I have a bit of success when I get my hands onto them. Oh, you guys know how to ask a lot of good questions, a lot of searching questions. So next section is more personal questions and questions about me. But before I start answering those, I have a feeling for like the last 10 minutes I've been talking with little white seeds in my hair. I've just looked back at a little bit of the footage. If I did, I'm very sorry. If they're still there, I'm even more sorry. We have a field nearby that's gone to seed and a whole load of those seeds are just drifting over and landing everywhere. <laughs> so my first question about me comes from Roland Romack. Hi Roland, you leave a load of comments in my videos and it's great to see. 
and your question is how much time do you spend with gardening and making these videos? Are you a full-time YouTuber? Well Roland, no, I'm not a full-time YouTuber. I wish I was a full-time YouTuber, that would be incredible to be able to spend my time working in the garden and filming, but no, I have a day job that's very different to gardening. So if I'm not at work and I have days off, I would spend a long time in the garden. The garden really is pretty big at an acre and it's fairly high maintenance. So I would say on average, I'm spending a few hours pretty much every day working on it. Some days I'll spend an entire day. Sometimes I'll have a run of several days where I just work non-stop on it. Other days I'll just chill out in the garden. Though I'm not very good at that, I tend to chill out for about a minute and then spot things that need to be done. In terms of YouTube, I can normally get a video filmed in a couple of hours if I'm doing well. If I'm having a bad day, I can almost take an entire day to film it because I'm a bit of a perfectionist about trying to get everything looking nice and sounding nice and the framing looking good. Uh, it also depends on what I'm working on when I'm doing it. If it's a nice easy video like this, I'll get through it quickly. If it's a big project like working on the veg garden or working on the polytunnel, I'll film over a number of days just so that I can space the work out. Right, next question comes from Katie M and she's asking, do you do all the gardening by yourself? Uh, no, I don't. A lot of it I do by myself, but I also have a very nice other half, a very nice partner, and he helps me hugely when I really need it. So the garden is pretty much my domain and he gives me creative freedom to do whatever I want, but there are times where a job just needs an extra set of hands. Uh, you know, like if you're trying to keep on top of the grass or cut hedges or shift soil or something like that. So he will help me a lot. So thank you very much to him. He's not appearing in this video, by the way. He's not here. I'm on my own in the garden today. As well as that, I have a couple of brilliant friends that step in and help me when I've got a really big job or when I'm despairing. They're brilliant, so thank you to them. But also, and I think this is something to talk about, I would not be against getting a gardener in the future if I needed, again, just an extra set of hands to get me through a job. I think a load of people have an expectation, particularly on people that have YouTube channels, that we should be able to manage all of this by ourselves. That's just not realistic. Um, I think sometimes people put unrealistic expectations on themselves as well. If you need a bit of help, get yourself a gardener if you can afford one. And I think it's a good idea. I think it can really help you out. And yeah, I might do the same. But as you can see, although I do a lot here, I don't do it all by myself. Okay, Gloss Allotmentier asks, what is your first gardening experience you can remember? And why does growing tickle your fancy? So I have hazy memories of being a little kid in the first house that I lived in with my mum and she was quite a keen gardener and still is quite a keen gardener and we had a rockery and a little veg patch and I kind of remember toddling around the garden and eating peas out of pods and I think we had carrots so I have little hazy memories of things like that but also I have memories of being at my grandparents house and heading up the garden as a kid all the time and harvesting strawberries out of their greenhouse. The other part of that question, why does growing tickle my fancy? I love growing stuff and then getting the kickback of seeing it being successful, whether it's something that you can eat or whether it's something beautiful. I just love all of that and I love being able to shape the space around me. So that kind of drives me on and that's definitely what tickles my fancy. YYZ, YYZ Gardener asks, where are some of your favorite gardens to visit and draw inspiration from? I love this question because I have three places in my head that are just so clear. So the first one is called Mount Stewart. It's a National Trust property in Northern Ireland. It was a few years ago ranked in the top 10 gardens in the entire world. And it's only about 15 minutes drive from where I grew up. So I would have spent so many Sunday afternoons going there with my mum or my grandparents. It's got beautiful, huge landscaped gardens that you can walk around with a lake and trees. It's got formal gardens, it's got a neoclassical house. Look it up online, it's really, really inspirational. And if you ever get a chance to visit, go and visit. The next place is Highgrove, which is Prince Charles's uh, residence in the UK. I was lucky enough to get to go and visit that back when I was in horticulture college, and it just blew me away. It has the same thing that I was talking about here, 
albeit on a much grander scale, I'm not trying to compare here to Highgrove, but it has that feel of being a really old, mature garden, but it just has this really relaxed way about it. It was just beautiful and I, I still remember it and I still draw inspiration from it. And then the final place is a garden called Humelo, which is in the Netherlands and it is the home of Piet Udolf. Now Piet Udolf is just my all-time favourite uh, garden designer. I really draw a lot of inspiration from him. He creates these beautiful prairie planting style gardens, but I've never actually visited Humelo and I think it's closed to the public now forever but I draw a lot of inspiration from it, from seeing it online and seeing it in video. So Kelly Laird asks, where did your passion for gardening come from? What are your inspirations? Okay, so where my passion came from, it very much came to me through osmosis, through my family. My mum is a really good gardener and a really keen plants woman. She's probably gonna be really embarrassed at me saying this, but she is a plants woman. She collects really lovely plants and all the way through my childhood, I would have gardened with her. She would have encouraged me to grow my own things. I had my own little flower bed growing sunflowers. Uh, we would have grown some little veggies when I was very tiny and she would have taken me to all sorts of gardens. Also, my grandparents had a beautiful back garden and I would have spent time gardening with them as well. Picking strawberries, which I've already mentioned. So that's where really my passion originated. In terms of inspiration though, I'm going to go with two things. In terms of a person, I've already mentioned him, Pete Udolf, incredible designer, incredible plants person, and I want to create a whole Pete Udolf inspired section to this garden in the future. It's going to be massive work, so I'm not sure when I'm going to get a chance to do it. Also in terms of inspiration, BBC Gardener's World, every time, total obsessive about that show, and I pretty much don't miss an episode. It just always has something that piques my interest, and I always end up taking notes on my phone, whether it's for something to do, something to try, or a plant that I want to grow. Now, the next question comes from a good friend of mine, and that's naturally JB. JB has his own YouTube channel all about allotmenteering. I'll link it up above. Go and check him out. He is just a brilliant guy. He's a great friend, and he's having some nice success in his allotment. And he asks a really good personal question, which is, you've mentioned before that you have some horticultural qualifications. Do you still draw from these in planning and designing your garden? Were they useful in practice? So you may not know this. I've only mentioned it a couple of times, but I went to horticulture college when I left school because that's what I wanted to study but actually I don't have a horticultural qualification because although I went to study a degree in horticulture, I only did a year and then I left to pursue training in what is now actually my day job, which is very different from horticulture. But in that one year, I learned so much. We did garden design, soil science, botany, weed science, fungi science. We did practical stuff. We laid lawns, we pruned fruit trees, we grafted, we did cuttings, we did so much. And I still draw on that knowledge because it was those foundations, those first principles that I can still come back to all the time. And in fact, what I've realized, some of those learnings are things that I try and impart now through the channel that I think you'll find useful as well. Okay, question from Joni Chamberlain, and she asks, how did you and Liz Zorab first connect? So most of you I'm sure will know of Liz Zorab. If you don't, her channel's linked up above. She is a firm friend. I got to know her, oh, maybe about nine months ago now. Liz is a homesteader, self-sufficiency, uh, small holding person who has just an epic channel. And she's written a brilliant book recently. Uh, she first connected with me through a homesteading YouTube group. And like I say, since then we've been good friends. Okay. Here is a really good question. What's been your biggest ever gardening fail? Okay, honesty time. It's an easy one to answer because it happened recently. If you didn't see the video where I was talking about being exhausted, the full story is there. But basically I do my monthly seed sowing videos and in those videos I'd been sowing seeds that I'd then brought on as seedlings and baby plants. Long story short, I left them in the polytunnel one day the weather got unexpectedly sunny while I was out. The temperatures hit high 40s in the polytunnel. Everything dead, pretty much everything dead. 
disastrous. That is easily my worst fail. And what made it worse was I felt really responsible that I had been showing everything on YouTube as well, and now everything was destroyed. It was a nightmare. Definitely my biggest gardening fail. Okay, here is a really lovely question uh, that comes from Elizabeth, and she asks, what do you love about gardening? Dot, 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 and dot, 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 what gets you down in the garden? Okay, let's talk about what gets me down first, because then we'll go on to the positive. Honesty time, what gets me down in the garden is that I'm actually a really bad perfectionist and not in a good way at times. And because of that, I want everything to look good all the time. Coupled with that, I want to be able to get a job done in one go so that it's done and it's all perfection. And that is not realistic. And sometimes I end up having a battle in my head between what I want and what's realistic. And that's what can get me down is if I start a job and it's midway through and I'm not happy with it. Like for instance, behind me, I took down the hedges, but there's still a whole load of stuff that needs tidied. I hate that. But on the plus side, I have a whole load more light. And if I was to turn the negative into a positive, that's what the garden is teaching me is it's teaching me patience and how to be hopefully less of a perfectionist. But what do I love about gardening? What I love is the ability to shape and craft the environment around me aesthetically for my own pleasure and also for nature. There's something lovely about owning my own little corner of Ireland and it being enclosed and being my own little, well, I suppose my own little private world that if I want, I can just spend days in. I just absolutely love that and it drives me on day after day to keep working and keep making it better and better. And the very last question for today comes from Lily Rose and she says, I think you need a dog to keep you company in the garden. Did you ever think of getting one? Well, you may have just seen in the corner there that there's two little friends that I still haven't introduced you to and that's because we already have two dogs. So. I should really probably introduce them to you. Come on, girls. Hey, come on. So this little one is Jampa. She is one of our two miniature schnauzers and she is just over a year old. And yes, you're gorgeous, aren't you? Do you want to go and run around the garden? Do you want to? Okay, go on, go on. <laughs> and our other dog is Peggy. Peggy is uh, how old are you now? Are you nine? Peggy is a nine-year-old black and silver miniature schnauzer and she's just an absolute love and really I wouldn't be without either of them and yeah you help me in the garden sometimes but generally I don't have them on camera and not intentionally but I just realized that I haven't had them on camera for ages. You're gonna get down? Go on. So let me know in the comments down below because maybe you'd like to see a little bit more of these two running around in the background. It could be a little bit like Monty Don and his dogs. Thank you so much to everybody that took the time to think up a question, write it down and send it in. Hopefully I've answered all of your questions to your satisfaction. And for everybody watching, hopefully you feel like you know me a little bit better now, that you know the garden a little bit better. And I suppose you see what makes me tick and why I love this place and why I love gardening so much. Now, like I said at the start, if you have a question that hasn't already been answered, why not leave it in the comments down below and I'll see if I can answer it for you. Or maybe what we'll also do is have another Q&A session, possibly when I hit like a big subscriber milestone or something like that, we'll have a little bit of a blowout, a little bit of a celebration and I'll answer a whole load more questions for you. But that's for another time. I go to get back to the garden and I'd say you've got to get back to the garden too. So until next time, see you later.